Ah, you are young, oh. Uh, Sorry, you are old, though. Uh -huh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I don't even know what to say again. Are you even old or young? I am old. Ah, okay. Some people say that they are old. <laughs> Maybe I'm one of them. <laughs> Some people feel they're old. No, they say I'm old, but let's see. I think I hope in that category. You served above 30. Uh-huh. Nah, fam. <laughs> people are already asking me online, where's Mr. Reno? We can't say you who can protest. Reno lives matter. Reno's life matter. <laughs> oh, my man. Everybody is waiting, ladies and gentlemen. This year, don't rock it, do. We're going in hard. I'm okay. waiting. Can you follow your Instagram handle? Sorry? Can you please come out your Instagram handle? At oh, Daddy no FRZ, way. but they should listen on the radio. Daddy Freeze, okay. but they should listen on the radio. You're going to get the full Renault Amokri experience on the radio. It's 99.3 Nigeria Info. This is where it's happening. It's not happening on social media. It's happening on the radio. So, I just, yeah. Okay, Reno is here, ladies and gentlemen. Boom, boom, boom. That's right. So, uh, okay, there we go. Waiting to connect. Mr. Amok. Hello, can you hear me? Absolutely. Clear. Okay, very good, very good. Yeah. How clear is it? Is it clear? Is it clear? Hello? Yes. Ada, I can hear you. Yeah, Renu, I'm off. I just say something. All right, Renu, um, Ada requests for you to say something. Okay, say something, Mr. Reno, so we can have um, you. Hello, Defer Dayo, how are you doing? And um, hi to your listeners, and this is Reno Malgri. And um, I've got one of my colleagues, her name is Ada. She's our radio wife, um, Ada Blessing, so she's going to be coordinating for us. And um, this is a very wonderful opportunity to have you live. This is the first time I'm having you um, live. So, ladies and gentlemen, are you all ready? Because Reno is. So, um, we're setting up for Facebook too, so um, available in perpetuity. And um, I must say, we're proud of you. You're one African that we're proud of because oh, thank of you very the much. fact that you love to educate you love to educate people, especially our young men and women. Um, the Renault Nuggets have been a success. Many times I've been tempted to steal one or two. <laughs> <laughs> but pride will not let me. You know, I, 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 there's, there's a, a black man's nothing without his pride. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm giving you carte blanche right now. If I've not stolen any of your nudgets, it's not because I'm a good guy. It's simply because I have a pride and I also want to be seen as original. But <laughs> many of the things you've said are, are worth noting and keeping for perpetuity. Ladies and gentlemen, he needs no introduction, so I'll just present him to you. He is the one and the only Reno or Mockery, former presidential uh, advisor and best-selling author. I like the best-selling author part. Uh, not many Nigerians can claim to be on the best-sellers list, and he's one of them. Yeah. And there are many things he says that we think in our hearts but cannot say, maybe because we don't have the platforms, 
that's like 10% of it and the remaining 90% because we don't have the knowledge. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Mr. Omokri. How have you been and how are you doing? Well, I'm very good. I'm very good. And um, thank you. Um, well, I just want to state uh, two corrections. Um, I was a presidential spokesperson, uh, not a presidential advisor, presidential spokesperson. And um, yes, it's good to be modest, but I also need to say that uh, um, I'm not a number, I'm not a best-selling author. I'm a number one best-selling author. There's a big difference. It takes a lot of hard work to be number one. <laughs> Hey, Adareno has started. Oh. But I apologize and I must give credit to whom credit is due. Number one best selling author, ladies and gentlemen, Reno Omokri. Thank you. And that also has to be a part of it because there's no way you and I are going to have a show and a couple of religious questions or a couple of questions about Christianity are not going to creep in. It's absolutely impossible, no matter how hard I try. But, you see, let us start with some very interesting um, questions. There was an, a mail from uh, Governor El Rufai where he referred to ladies using the H word, or, or should I say, um, the H word that has a synonym, which is a B word. Um, you know, we're on the radio, so we still have to censor what we're, what we're talking about. What's your take on that? Well, um, I think a, a month ago, Nasir El Rufai's son, uh, by name Bilo El Rufai, had uh, said something very derogatory about uh, the Igbo people of Nigeria. And um, he called their women a name I'm not going to use. And uh, he threatened to gang rape um, uh, someone's mother. And it raised a, a big fuss on... Um, on social media. And, you know, like when people were condemning uh, the young man and asking um, his mother to step in, the mother said, and I quote, all is fair in love and war. She later apologized for that, but that was an afterthought. But what people don't know is that this boy learned how to behave that way at home. And why am I saying so? I'm not saying if I used to be my, probably my best friend. You know, as a matter of fact, we were so close that my wife would complain about my, I mean, that we are always uh, talking to each other on the phone. Sometimes we could talk to each other 10 days, uh, sorry, 10 times in a day. You know, we got so close. And I'll say, I mean, I've never said this um, um, on radio or on TV. You know, I've said this in, in writing. Um, my, my late father, you know, El Rufai was the last person to talk to my late father. He called my late father to talk to my late father to tell, to thank my late father for all I'd done for him. And after that call, my father died. You know, so Elfai and I, we are that close. Now, close. In t yeah, in, 20, um, in 2011, Elfai had sent me an email, and I still have that email. I sent it to my lawyers, you know, for safekeeping, where in, in which uh, Southern Nigerian women were referred to as, as uh, basically um, the word that you would use for a commercial, um, uh, uh, so a woman... What? Uh, yeah, yeah. So a, a woman in the red light district. I mean, South. He, did, he didn't say all women. So, uh, the email referred not to all women, but to Southern Nigerian women. And I have that wow. email. And uh, um, uh, for 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 some time right now, you know, um, somebody has been trying. I mean, seriously to hack into my emails. You know, I've been in contact with Yahoo. Um, I, will, I, I have the documents. They pinpointed it down to Nigeria, to central Nigeria, to the Kadu, to Kaduna area and Abuja. Now, I don't know who is doing that. But if anybody is trying to hack my emails, thinking they can find that email, uh, they shouldn't bother. It's with my lawyer. Hmm. Wow. 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 That's pretty scary. Um... I would never have believed that you and El Rufai were that close. It, well, I mean, it's, we, it's, are, we, we used to be very, very close. I mean, we used to be very close. Um, when I was first offered a political appointment by former President Jonathan, El Rufai was the first person I, con I consulted. And then he asked me to take it. But then I was vice president of a political consulting firm in the U.S. And um, I, just, I, I just didn't think that it was, it was right for me to leave. So I, I, I didn't take it then. But I mean, we, were, we were so close. It's not just um, myself and El Rufai. Even Malam Nuhu Ribadu visited me in California. You know, in my house, there's pictures of Nuhu Ribadu playing with my children. 
I mean, that's how we were, I mean, we were, we were very close. You know, if you go on my Facebook page, you'll see pictures of, of, my, of me and uh, of Verify and I, um, because I spoke at, um, I, I spoke at, uh, at the U.S. Congress, and then um, my friend then, um, Ambassador Robin Sanders, I was able to persuade her to invite Nasir el uh, because he was having problems coming into the U.S., and I just wanted to do him a favor. We, we, we were very, very close. And, you know, el Rufai is someone that likes to sue people. You know, so, I mean, he knows me. I'm a very meticulous record keeper. I encourage him, if I've, if I've told a lie about him, he, he should sue me. Mm, okay, okay. All right, it's getting hot in here. Um, let's speak a little bit about your, um, just in passing, uh, your relationship with uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan uh, and uh, your rating of the last... Um, I don't want to make any comparisons. Let's just speak about your working office and your relationship with former President Goodluck Jonathan. Uh, is it still cordial up to date? Uh, what were the things that you believe that um, uh, President Goodluck Jonathan did during his tenure that were beneficial to Nigeria? I at least point to one or two. And then because um, the next question is outside the country. So I want us to talk about your time in office in Nigeria. So, well, former President Jonathan is probably the most decent human being I've ever met, you know, and uh, we're very, very close. Um, he spent 10 days with my family and I in California last year. Um, what was it last year? Yeah, uh, hang on. Uh, you know, I travel so much. I'm trying to remember. No, no, no. It wasn't last year, the year before, 2018. He spent 10 days with my family and I. We're very close. You know, we're very, very close. And while he was in office, this was a man that... I mean, a lot of people don't realize how humble, uh, how humble uh, um, he is. You know, um, if, you, if you recall, he built 165 Almajiri schools for Almajiris in the north. And then um, he, he, was being, he was heavily criticized by, uh, when, he, when he did that, you know, um, in 2011. But look at right now. Right now, what's happening with the Amajiris? They have nowhere to put them. Um, they are rejecting them, even in northern states. That's to show you that the man had vision. You know, and then if you look at how he managed the economy, obviously um, the APC then, and I don't want to mention names, but they did a lot of propaganda, you know, like, and then he said something in 2014. He said, um, I am the most insulted president in the world, uh, but when I leave office, you all will remember me, you know, for the total freedom that you enjoyed under my government. My government. And it, it was almost prophetic because if you see what's happening right now, I mean, are Nigerians free? And Nigeria's prosperous. So I, mean, I don't want to go too much and because uh, I don't want to put you in trouble by talking about, because, um, you know, I have a nickname, Bu uh, Buhari Tormento. I don't want to go into that. You know, so I'll just say that former That's President Jonathan, former President yeah. Jonathan, um, he, he is, I'll just say this, um, two politicians, and you know, I've met with politicians, world leaders, uh, um, traveling around the world for my free leader, Sharibu campaign. Two of the most decent human beings I've ever met in my life, former President Jonathan and Malam Nuhu Ribadi. Hmm. Absolutely wonderful. Um, there's a guitar in your background. Do you play yeah. the guitar? Oh yeah, I play the guitar. Would you like me to play? Okay, even if it's just ten seconds, let's let's hear how verse. Uh, okay, but I, I might have to come. I have because I've got to plug. I've got to plug it into okay. uh, the amp. No, no, I can do it. I can plug it into the amp. But, but just give me a second. Let me do that. Hold on. All right, all right. Sweetheart, I... sweetheart, bring the amp. Bring the amp, sweetheart. We have never seen before. Okay, but you got to plug that. You got to plug that, sweetheart. Yeah, right there. Uh, wow. Um. Ada, what musical instrument can you play? Okay, very quickly because you're waiting. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay. You're still learning how to play the keyboard. Yeah, I'm still on the keyboard. Oh, well, you can try it. Um, the... Oh, you're on the level. Oh, thank you. Anyone, anyone, quickly? Thanks, sweetheart. Ladies and gentlemen, Renu Amokri is going to serenade us with his guitar skills. Oh, wow. Okay, that increase the volume. Okay. Hold on, hold on, sorry. Um, got to push it in, I think. Yeah. Here it is. Okay. okay, hold on. Uh, I think we got the wrong one. Okay, try. Is it in? Hang on, hang on. Someone let's let's look for volume. I can't hear you. It's not on Cool FM, guys. 
Nigeria info. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right, let's go. Sorry, I'm trying to tune it. It's not been tuned for a while. Sorry. No problem. Ada? While you're tuning it, is that a picture of Boris? Yeah, that's Boris Johnson, yeah. It's Boris Johnson. Okay, we'll talk about that when we finish serenade. Are you ready? Yep. Yeah, okay. Sorry. No built. The phone. You like that? Yeah. Okay. Like and then see, if, see, if, see if you can see if you can recognize this tune. Okay, hang on. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've not seen this in a while. Can you get that? Um well, no. Can you tell us what it is? Okay, I'll do it one more time. I'll do it one more time. Ada, help me. Renu is about to set me up. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you don't know that? I do, but it's just not coming. Oh, okay, okay. I'll do it one more time. Hang on. One more time. Ada, please help us, help us, help us. You don't know that, okay? Somebody, somebody. Yes. You are lost. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll go back so that your viewers um we can continue the interview. Let's not just okay. take a, I, okay. hang up on this. Okay, so you can have that. Yeah. Somebody to say. He lives in me. That's the song. Uh, okay, okay. Well, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I just I just tried. I just tried. I just tried. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Sorry. All right. I um, haven't tuned the guitar in a while. Lovely though. Lovely to see that you um you're skilled and um I know you to be a family uh family man. Um I also know you to be friends with Boris Johnson. Um, but I didn't know you were so close that you guys have pictures together. Uh so let's talk a little bit about Boris Johnson with over uh, or about 40,000 deaths to um, of COVID-19 in the UK. Do you think the way the UK government handled um, the coronavirus pandemic was, do you think they handled it well or do you think they dropped the ball? And uh, when you're done, I also want us to talk about Donald Trump and the United States of America with over 100,000 deaths and almost 2 million um, confirmed cases. Do you think uh, that Donald Trump handled the pandemic well? Okay, let's talk about the United Kingdom. With Boris Johnson, what a lot of people don't realize is that um, the United Kingdom and the United States are suffering because of their transparency. You know, um, the issue is that, that there's been a lot more um, deaths in, uh, in other countries, even in European countries. But, all, I mean, the United Kingdom and the United States are some of the most open democracies in the world. You know, there's, there's a lot of transparency, and that's why all these deaths are coming into play. So if you talk, I mean, a lot of people see China and say China have done well. You know, like China, there's no way to reliably even um, confirm their figures. The figures in China are much worse than what people are saying. Look at what's happening in Brazil. You know, um, a lot of people are talking about Brazil, but the figures there in Brazil are actually even much worse than what you're seeing. In the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson has done a very, very good job. Um, he's been able to, make, to work that fine balance between uh, the economy, keeping the economy open uh, long enough uh, before the shutdown, and then uh, um, uh, working about on health and safety. 
So I think he's, been, he's done quite a good job. In the United States, uh, President Trump has done a very good job, but this is an election year. And because it's an election year, I mean, everything he does is going to be weaponized. You know, mm. if, if you look at what's happening in the United States, you know, like the way they've been able to scale up testing and then the way they've been able to provide uh, ventilators. And it's not just that they've, they've been able to provide ventilators for everybody in America who needs them. And then not, ju not just that, they are now donating ventilators to other countries. Nigeria got um, 1,100 uh, ventilators, you know. So I think pretty much they've done, um, uh, UK and US, I think they've done a good job. Okay, absolutely. We're going to go on a quick break. Ada, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, so let's go on a quick break and then come right back. We have Reno Omri in the building. Absolutely. Reno, you will not believe it. Some people were complaining about how I was drinking from the <laughs> Can they hear us? The world ah. can. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. So, um... <laughs> everybody on media can hear us. Okay, okay, okay. Now, am I not at home? Lorenzo, <laughs> your look is very nice. I love the beards. You oh, thank you. This, this um, stylish. Uh, gray beard look. Oh, sweetheart, come and give me a kiss in front of everybody. My wife is the inventor of these beards. Come, 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 come on. Okay, ju just, 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 just so people can see uh, the woman who has done this. Uh, my wife, say, come, 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 come. This is the first. Uh, this is the first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the that's the person that's uh, responsible for these beards. That's the first time we've ever seen her ever on on social media. No, she's my wife is very camera shy. This is the first time I can think of that she's ever done this. She's ever, in fact, and you see how I had to beg her and beg her and beg her. She's just she's very camera shy. Okay. Mm. So many so many questions to ask. I don't want the radio audience to miss out, so we'll just be chatting while we're waiting for them to catch up. Okay. Um, someone said, we can take this off the air since we're not, I don't think we're going to be talking about the UK and the US. But Chantel Flower Kekumo, Kekumo said, the UK and the US messed up. What do you think? Well, well, it's, it's, it's easy to say that, you know, um, from because you have to understand, everybody has a, pov, a point of view. You know, so, I mean, if you have um, an elephant and then you get 10 people to touch the elephant from different uh, parts of, of the elephant, some people might say, no, it's not an elephant, it's a rhino. And other people, they touch it, they say, no, it's not an elephant, it's a, a giraffe. So it's, it's a point of view. Sorry? Some people even say it's a wall. Exactly. You know, so it's a, it's a point of view saying that... Um, 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 the UK messed up. No, the UK didn't mess up. If you look at the UK, for instance, you know, the UK has um, a population of um, a lot of people who are over 65. They have a, lot, a population of a lot of these people, um, they, uh, they live uh, by themselves because um, the UK is one of the few countries that if they don't have um, immigration, um, their population is actually going to start falling because women tend to have fewer than um, one baby. That's uh, white Caucasian women. So you have a lot of households with just um, people who are over 65 year olds, you know, and then they're just alone. And so they're very vulnerable. It's not like a lot of countries like um, um, in the Mediterranean and then in Africa and in um, other parts of the world. In the UK uh, and then in Nordic countries, they have this unique problem. And the way they've been able to balance this, I mean, it's very, and very- And a lot of smokers. Exactly. Although uh, smoking in the UK has uh, reduced since 2002 because the UK government in 2002 banned, um, um, uh, uh, not smoking, but they banned uh, cigarette ads exactly from being, from being shown on TV. So the, the real issue is the, 60, uh, is the over 65s who are at home. And can you believe it that government has people actually going to shops to buy foods for them and bring to their house, dropping in front of their house, and then uh, ask them to come out and see them physically. And then you go on an app and then you report to government. And, I mean, just look at the care that government is taking of them. And then someone somewhere is just saying that they messed up. It's just because you don't have the full facts. 
Okay, um, go back on the radio in a few minutes. All right, um, welcome, Reno Amokri. Thank you so much, my beautiful Ada. Um, Reno Amokri is in the building, and uh, we've talked about uh, El Rufai. We've talked about the UK and the US response to COVID-19, what his opinion is. And um, I want to ask... A lot of people say you are seen as a Trump supporter. Is that true? Well, I, I wouldn't say I'm a Trump supporter. It's just because, like, I follow the facts. I'm not, um, I'm not emotional, you know. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's one of the things that has helped me in my life, you know, at least to be a very stable person. And then, um, I'm very loyal. You know, people that have worked with me have always told, told me, you know, I'm very loyal. Whether it, it's um, former President Jonathan, uh, people I've worked with in the States, um, even in this country. My first job um, ever after I left school was in, um, was, uh, in a parliament. You know, so I have that nature whereby um, I try to be very, very factual. I follow the facts. And then if you look at what's been happening under Trump, yes, Trump is a very divisive figure because he's not a politician. You know, he came from um, a celebrity background. And then so he's used to, 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 there's no filter. Trump doesn't have a filter. You know, so he just, exactly. So, and, and, and you, both of you have the same background. Like you, Daddy Freeze, you have the same background. It's just like the president of, um, um, of uh, Mauritius. Sorry, not Mauritius, um, Madagascar. The president of Madagascar is like you. He was a former DJ. So, I mean, these people, they don't have filters. So, like, they just say things. You know, someone like uh, Obama was a politician. So, Obama can, uh, um, he can say, you know, he, he knows how to sugarcoat words. Trump is not going to do that. So, but let's look at the facts. Look at black unemployment. Under Trump, I mean, black unemployment is not the best it's been in five years. It's the best ever. It's best ever. If you go on, um, my, my, um, on my social media, you'll see um, me and the governor of Florida. We were together. Now, the governor of Florida is, is no longer the governor. He's now a senator. But when he was governor, Governor Rick Scott, he, he, uh, he was talking to me uh, and, um, in Florida, and he was telling me about how the, um, the president has helped him to reduce uh, unemployment in his state, Florida, to the point whereby unemployment was so low among African Americans that the state in uh, Florida was having to, they had like, like um, an excess of food stamps. Because if you live in the States, you know that a lot of poor people, they depended on food stamps. Food stamps. But now, yeah, food stamps. So that they've almost, they've, they almost retired that system in Florida. So if you look at what Trump, uh, what Trump has done for the black community, you know, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about like rhetoric, you know, I'm talking about tangible things. You know, it's, it's enough, you know, because like, I am not going to look at um, emotions. I'm going to look at the facts. You know, black home ownership is at, is one of its h highest levels ever. And then look at with, with the, um, with the uh, pandemic, you know, like uh, a lot of people felt that, okay, America's economy was going to tank. Obviously, the pandemic affected America's economy. But what happened? Um, the May jobs report came, just came out. Everybody was hoping, well, not everybody, uh, a lot of people were thinking that it was going to be a disaster. But America added 2.5 million jobs. So I follow the facts. I'm not an emotional person, you know. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned the uh, Madagascar president, um, and that brings me to the famous Madagascar juice, the famous Madagascar potion. Um, Madagascar claims that they have um, a cure for COVID-19, and th their cure can also um, act as a preventive agent for COVID-19. Now, with over 1,200 confirmed cases and less than uh, 200 recoveries and with about nine deaths. What is your take? Do you think Madagascar, uh, Mad the Madagascar's president was just being the DJ that he's 
known to be, or do you agree that Madagascar has the potential for providing the world with a cure? Well, you know, um, again, I'm a very factual person, you know, I'm very definite and uh, I'm not emotional. Um, I mean, I mean, like, obviously you can see with my wife, because she's so beautiful, I can be very emotional with my wife. But when I look at the, the issues, the politics, I'm, 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 I follow the facts. Um, Madagascar, uh, they do not have um, a research and development capacity. So, yes, I believe in herb, um, herbalism, you know, I, I believe in that a lot. And if Madagascar is offering the drugs for free, then by all means, you know, nations like Nigeria should take them. But if Madagascar is saying, okay, we want mula, then, I mean, uh, if you want mula, you've got to prove to us that your, um, your, your herbs work. So if you can show us like uh, A and B testing and that this works, uh, then we're going to go for it. But until then, you know, like um, I'm a bit skeptical. Absolutely um, wonderful. Now, as we're coming towards home, let's talk about Black Lives Matter. Let's talk about um, George Floyd. I've had this conversation several times on the radio, and I feel personally that the Yes, there are. There's the undertone of racism in the George Floyd um, situation. But I feel it's more so police brutality than actual racism. And why do I say that? Because um, there were the, the, the four cops were four different nationalities. One was Hispanic, one was white, one was black, and one was Asian. So I find it hard to pin racism on that entirely. You know, the narrative, the global narrative is it's racism. Oh, yes, there are undertones of racism. However, I see this as more of police brutality. And I see um, my personal opinion here. I may be wrong. Uh, you are more in the system home and abroad, and you might be in a better position to correct me on this, but I see this as a lot of, I, I see a lot of political undertones. I see election year coming um, uh, around the corner and them trying to push the racism narrative in order to downplay some candidates and uh, give some candidates advantage. Yes, we all do that in politics. Um, I might agree with the fact that Trump did not react well uh, to the George Floyd killing initially. But like you said, he's, he's not a politician. He just said his mind. So what's your take? Do you think this is pure racism as it's being portrayed to the world? Or do you think it has political undertones? Do you think, do you think it's it's more of politic, uh, police brutality, and we should face police brutality instead of trying to... Uh, yes, there is racism, no doubt about it. There's systemic racism. Uh, there are undertones of racism, and the black people in the world have really suffered. But my problem is, is this really the case, or is this just that little straw on the camel's back that broke the entire um, load? So what's your take on that? Okay, well, again, let's follow the facts, you know, let's, let, let's follow the facts, not emotion. Um, uh, George Floyd was, uh, he, this unfortunate incident happened, and it took two days, um, two days um, for um, a, rea a response to, to happen. By the third day, Derek Chauvin had been uh, put under custody. And then within eight days, all the, other, all the, uh, the, the, all the cops, the four of them, were in custody. Uh, they're going to be charged, they're going to be tried. Now, if you look at that now, you see that there, is, um, there, there was response. And then it's easy to say, okay, well, Trump did not um, react well. No, this is not Nigeria. This is America. You have a federal system in place. You know, it's, uh, even, it's not even the governor of Minneapolis that's uh, in charge of it. It's the mayor. And if you look at their response, they did act well. You know, they got the, the, the man who, uh, who, who was behind it, Derek Chauvin. And he, what he did was condemnable. You know, he should 
face uh, the punishment for his crimes. But I mean, if you look at what's happening in America, there's consequences for bad behavior. Nobody, there has been, not been a situation in America uh, for, the, uh, for, for this year. And then in fact, in the last four years, whereby you've got a cop who has done something like this and then he goes scot-free. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not gonna happen. There's gonna be consequences for your action. Now let's look at ourselves in Nigeria. Do we have that in Nigeria? And then we are saying that, okay, like um, what's happening in America, Black Lives Matter. Look, America treats African-Americans much better than Nigeria treats our own people. On December 12, 2015, 347 men, women, children, and infants were killed in Zaria because the chief of army staff did not want to uh, um, uh, uh, have an issue with the Shites when they were having a road procession. Three, I, I mean, I'm sure you followed me on social media when I put the pictures of some of the babies that were killed in that instance. What happened to Buratai? Nothing. As a matter of fact, Buratai was promoted to Lieutenant General after that incident. So if you, if you face the fact, you see, if the riots and then the protesting that's happening in America, you see that a lot of the communities that are being uh, dealt with are black communities. A lot of the uh, properties that are destroyed are black properties. I mean, a number of people have been killed, I mean, with this Black Lives Matter protest. And these are black people. Now, I'll tell you something, Daddy Freeze, if I have an issue with you, and then I gather a group of people, and I say, let's protest to get Daddy Freeze off the air. And then within two days, Nigerian Info gets you off the air, and I keep on protesting. Then what am I protesting for? You see, you, what, one of the things that we, you, uh, we need to realize is this, is protests are a very, very, um, um, violent protests are a very ineffective way to have change. Protests, peaceful protests are uh, an effective way to have change. And that's, you see, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act, it was because of uh, peaceful protests. You had Selma, you had uh, Montgomery, which was a PAX. Peaceful protest, but when protest becomes violent, what you what you actually doing is you are reinforcing um, um, uh, the 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 what you call the racism of people who should actually help you. Look, I'm 46 year old. I'm 46 year old this year. I became resident in America in 1983 when I was nine years old. I lived in Albany, California, a mostly white community. I'm 46 years old. I have not had one single incident of racism from white folk in America. If, as a matter of fact, as an African immigrant, you are more likely to be discriminated against in America by African Americans than you are to be discriminated against by uh, white folk. So, I mean, when, when people talk about this and say, okay, like uh, the Black Lives Matter, like black people are suffering in America, look, Blacks in America form 13%, not, not quite 13, approximately 13% of the population, actually it's 12.67. And yet in 2008, America elected a black man as president with a very black wife. So how racist are these people? So let's look at the facts. I mean, how racist are these people? If, uh, if, every, if all of the uh, black people voted for Obama, Obama could not have become president without the votes of, of white people. Absolutely. So, so, so I mean, look at... I mean, the votes. Exactly. So, let, let, so, so you look at what's happening in America. If you follow the facts, in America, look, the, the, well, I, I'll, actually, I'll give you an example. Nigerians in America form 0.1% uh, of the population. That means we are only 10% of 1%. Nigerians in America. We are only 10% of 1%. And then more so, Nigerians in America are massed in um, Houston, Atlanta, and then in uh, the Los Angeles area, whose team there is probably about uh, 320,000 Nigerians. Now, Nigerians in America are not going through this uh, so-called um, um, economic racism that uh, uh, African-Americans are going through. And you have to ask, ask yourself, why? Amy Chan wrote a book, The Tiger Mom. And your, your, your listeners should probably Google that book, How to Raise Your Child Like a, like a Nigerian. Nigerians in America are the most educated um, uh, uh, immigrant community of yeah. not, not one of the most, the most educated. 77% of all black doctors in America are Nigerians. Meanwhile, we are only 0.1% of the population. Now, you ask yourself, why are Nigerians, why are Nigerians so prosperous? And then the larger African-American uh, uh, community are not that prosperous. It's because of, uh, it's because in America right now, Every four years, the Democratic Party, they weaponize this, uh, these issues. They try to make things worse than they are. And if you watch CNN, 
and you try to use CNN uh, to gauge what's happening in America, I mean, it's, it's, you're going to have a very, very distorted view of America. America is the greatest country in the world to be a black man. I, did, I, just, I, I can tell you, if I, if I tell you how old I was when I bought my first house in America, I was like, I was very, very young. This is a country that offers you opportunity. If you are hardworking and smart working, America doesn't care if you are black or white. America cares about money. It's a capitalistic uh, society. So when you say that um, you know, there's racism in, in this, yes, there might be, but look at it. America has a population of about 360 million. America has 3.5 million cops. The overwhelming uh, uh, majority of the police interaction with people, both black and white, is not deadly, is not negative, it's positive. Obviously, you're going to have few instances like this. Now, the issue is not that you have them. The issue is that when they occur, are there consequences? And we've seen there are consequences. But when it comes to Nigeria, are there conse consequences? Look, in Nigeria, how, how many instances of police brutality have we had? And then what has been the consequences? June, 2, June 2nd, 2016, in Kano, a woman was beheaded. Her name uh, was Bridget Agbahime. She was beheaded, falsely accused of blaspheming the Quran. Till today, not, nobody has, has gone to prison. Nothing has been done against that woman. July 8, 2016, in Abuja, Kubra, 30 kilometers from Asorok, Pastor Eunice Olawale Elisha was killed because she was preaching the word of God. Till today, nothing has happened to her. She's a past, she was a pastor of the Redeemed Christian Church of, Church of God. Who is our vice president? Pastor Yemi Osibajo of the same Redeemed Christian Church of God. Nothing, has, been, nothing has, uh, has happened to her. Last week in Nigeria, I counted it, there were seven instances of police brutality. Five of them led to fatality. People died. As a matter of fact, the last incident was a case in Anambra State where a policeman killed a boy because the boy refused to give him a hundred naira bribe. No, what has happened to these people? Nothing. And then you are saying that, okay, well, um, in a country whereby there is um, uh, there's rule of law, whereby people uh, pay the consequences for their actions, that no, that this country is racist. No. I've been, I li I've been living in America as a resident since 1983. America is probably the greatest, not probably, America is the greatest country in the world. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have visited America several times. Um, but the impression I get of America is there are a lot of racist undertones. And um, even in this particular incident, I wouldn't put racism in the forefront, but I would put racism as something systemic that needs to be dealt with. That's my opinion. But since you've lived in America um, longer than I, I have, uh, I guess this is not something I can argue with um, you on. But honestly, I feel, especially from the pulse I'm getting from the people, that there still is quite a bit of racism. This George Floyd case might not be it, but I don't think we can, we can just throw racism under... Um, uh, Okay, well, uh, so, uh, let, me, let, let, me give you, let, let me give you an example. You know, obviously, you look, I mean, the only perfect uh, uh, society that you're ever going to get is heaven. As long as you're on earth, you're going to have, you're going to have uh, um, um, imperfect societies. So if you, if you want to take a, um, the American situation, like I told you, in America, I'll give you a very good example now. Look at uh, this um, um, woman, Lupita Nyong'o. Yes. A very, very dark-skinned, a very, very dark-skinned actor, or rather actress. Lupita won an Oscar. She's been celebrated in America. Right here in Africa, there are several, not once, not twice, several comedians who have made tasteless jokes about her skin color. Things that are, that, I mean, that are not happening in the U.S., so if you want to look at it, like, if you, if you want to look at it and say, okay, like, uh, America, there's going to be undertones of racism in America because people tend to, um, people tend to gravitate to um, people who look like them. So for instance, I'll give you an example. I went uh, on a Christian uh, a retreat. I went on a Christian re a retreat um, um, in California. And then I was the, probably the only black person in this retreat. And then, so what happens if you've ever been to a retreat, they, they, they hire some cooks and then you go and then you take food. So I got up to go and then um, take uh, a second helping. And then the guy said to me, oh, 
you're back again. Now, when that happened, if, if I was a sensitive person, I would say, oh, that is racism. Because I went there with my white uh, friend and then um, he didn't say the same thing with my white friend. But then you, you also have to look at the bigger picture. You know, perhaps it wasn't racism. Perhaps it was racism. But if you read racism into everything, it's going to hamper you even more than the racist. In, in, in America, a lot of Nigerians are very, very successful because they don't see racism in, um, in things that an African-American will see racism uh, in. Because, for instance, you grew up in Nigeria. The president that you saw was black. If you're, if you're flying a plane, the, the pilot is black. If you went to school, your school principal is black. If you went to see a doctor, your doctor was black. So you are not coming from a position whereby uh, black people were inferior. You're coming from a position where you see black people as being in authority. So it affects your gravitas. It affects the way the way um, um, uh, you, you 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 you. It affects your confidence. So some things that other people might see as racism, you don't see them as racism. So that's what that's the point I'm trying to make. A lot of things about racism is relative. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Now, the response to Black Lives Matter and the response to the xenophobic attacks in South Africa on Nigerians have been totally different. Um, the whole world stood up with America when one black man was killed but we didn't see that Peter, same response. Peter, some water, some water. Mm. But we didn't see that same response um, in South Africa when uh, Nigerians, not one, but several Nigerians um, were murdered. And um, we didn't see that same response. Uh, so my question is, we Nigerians are supporting their causes. How come they're not supporting our causes? Uh, what's your take on this? Well, you see, that's one of the things that you need to understand. You see, like, the black folk, black people, even in Nigeria and in America and around the world, we are being controlled by the media. So now, here you are, you're blaming African-Americans, saying they're not supporting you. The reason why you are supporting um, African-Americans now, the reason why uh, you are up in arms and, and supporting them is because of what you're seeing on CNN. Because of what you're seeing, when, whenever you, op um, if, you on, if you go on, um, on TV, on radio, you're being bombarded by the media with this. Now, we don't control media in the black world. We don't control media. So when something is happening in, um, in South Africa, now, it doesn't concern the, um, it doesn't affect the economic interest of the people who own CNN. There's no election that they, that, they, that they want to win in South Africa. So they are not going to use their media to uh, focus attention on what's happening in South Africa. So you'll be surprised that the blacks in America, African-Americans, are not even aware of what's going on there. So that's what I'm telling you. If we as blacks want to have any influence, we have to control, we have to go into two areas. We've got to have economic power and we have to have our own media. You see, this idea of just a protest and violent protesting, it's very reactionary. Look at the Jews. Let's learn from the Jews. The Jews in every country that they go to, they control two things. They control the economy and the media. And so what you do is that you use the economy to reward people and you use the media to fight people. So you use the media. So look who is controlling the media in America and the United Kingdom. It's the Jews. And you see, we have to learn from them because right now what's happening there is that we are being controlled. But, and you know, the media, people like the, the, the owners of CNN, they know how emotional black people can be. So they know what buttons to press. Excuse me, let me take a drink of water. They know what buttons to press. But we don't have our own media. It's, okay, I'll, I'll, let, let me localize it and give you a very good example. In Nigeria, several uh, former governors have been arrested even and tried and sent to pr uh, prison even though they, they come from the PDP and joined the APC. Now, of all these governors that were arrested and tried and sent to prison, only one has been released. Only one was able to get his release, Oji Uzokalu. Now, do you know that the reason why Oji Uzokalu was released might look to you like, 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 as if maybe it's because he, he was able to um, get uh, some very, very uh, powerful lawyers to argue his way. No. 
The reason why Oji Kalu was released is because he is the only Igbo man that controls a national media, the Daily Sun. So when you have a, when you have control of the media, people are afraid of you because you are able to use that to manipulate people, to influence people, to galvanize people. Black people, we don't have media. The Jews in America, they're able to make, they, they shake the president, they shake Congress, they shake government because they control the media, they control the economy. So the, when you, the media is, is, is like your air force, you know? So if I have a problem with you, I begin to like uh, carry negative stories on you. I begin to highlight things about you. I begin to influence because people are very visual. What they see on TV affects their judgments. And that's the issue. So don't blame the blacks in America. If we had our own media in Nigeria that you could watch if, when, you, when you put on cable TV in America, then we'll be able to influence uh, uh, African-Americans. We don't have that. So that's why we are being influenced by CNN, but we have no power of influencing others. Okay, um, let's come back home. Recently, there were killings um, in some parts of Nigeria that um, were motivated by tribalism and with undertones of religion. Uh, how do we forestall this? What steps do we take as a nation um, to remove tribalism and the sentiment of religious division that seems to be a stronghold on Nigeria? Listen to this. Um, this is the first time in the history of Nigeria where we've had the president, the head of the executive, as a uh, uh, northern Muslim, the head of the legislature, um, Ahmed Lawan, as a northern Muslim, and the head of the judiciary as a northern Muslim. It's never happened before. So there is no balance. Now you come to the armed forces, the head, the national security advisor is a northern Muslim, the head of the army is a northern Muslim, the head of the police is a northern Muslim, the head of the air force a northern Muslim, the head of the ESCC a northern Muslim, the head of the directorate of military intelligence a northern Muslim, the head of the um, NIS, Nigerian Immigration Service, a northern Muslim, the head of customs a northern Muslim. So you see, there is no balance in government and there's no balance in the military and paramilitary uh, sector. So when there's no balance, you're, going to, you're bound to have, going to, uh, have things like this happening because there is no, obviously people are going to be partial to their own ethnic groups. So that's why previous administrations, or in fact, we had 16 years of PDP administrations and then they've always had balance. When there's no balance, the, all, the reason why we're having this and the quantum at which we're having it in Nigeria right now is because we have a, we have a leadership that, they, that doesn't bring balance into government and into um, the military and the paramilitary, paramilitary forces. And unless you have balance, these things are going to keep on happening. Okay, um, real quick, uh, let's touch a little bit on religion. Um, on my sermon on Sunday, I had a wake-up call for us Africans. Um, I personally believe that the version of Christianity that um, we're practicing is the wrong version, is the colonial version, um, because Africa was mentioned um, in the scriptures, in the book of Acts chapter 8, uh, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, from biblical, from um, the creation, from the book of Genesis, um, Ethiopia was mentioned. Moses married a Cushite, which is an Ethiopian woman. So across scripture, we've got at least 60 references um, of Ethiopia and even more references of Egypt in the scriptures. And the narrative has been twisted, uh, in my opinion. And, and I want to ask for your opinion regarding this. Do you think, what's your take of the origin of Nigerians? And, and a lot of people uh, suggest that the Yoruba people have their origins in the scriptures. We've heard the Abia state governor who said Abia, Abia was mentioned in um, the Bible. We also have the Igbo people who would say that the word Igbo was taken from Hebrew. So what is your take on that? Well, one of the biggest challenges that um, we uh, have in Africa is the King James Version. 
you know, uh, growing up with the King James Version, you know, I was completely bi- blind to a lot of things until, I mean, God blessed me. I became successful. And then um, I've always had a love for God ever since I was a child. And so I learned how to uh, read um, Hebrew and uh, Greek. And I began to read scripture in the original languages. Um, I went to Ethiopia eight times. I went to Israel. I went to um, Egypt. And uh, I also, uh, I believe when I was going to Egypt, I invited you. Uh, you were a bit busy then. I went to the Vatican. I went to um, Greece. I actually, went, when I went to Greece, I went to Corinth. And then um, I went to Spain. I went to Montserra. I was looking for um, original scripture to read. You know, if, if, in the UK, I went to uh, John Ryland's University in Manchester, where you have the oldest scripture in the world. In, uh, in um, Ethiopia, I went to see the Garima Gospels, the oldest Gospels um, uh, uh, in the world. Now, the problem is when you read the King James Version, the King James Version is a translation. And so, and it's not a translation from original scripture. It's actually a translation from the Latin Vulgate. Oh. So it's like, it's like making a photocopy from a photocopy. So when you read the original uh, scripture, it opens your eyes. Your, your eyes are open to a lot of things. I'll, I'll give you a very good example. You talked about the origin of the Yorubas. Yes. You see, now, if you read Judges 19.11, uh, in Judges 19.11, um, uh, um, uh, Joshua was going to attack um, a city, was going to take a city. Well, he wasn't able to take that city. The name of that city is actually Jebus, Jebu, G-E-B-U-S, Jebus. Now, if you read about it, it it's in uh, Judges 19, 19.11, it's Jebus. Now, if you go to First Chronicles 11.5, that city is also called Jebus, J-E-B-U-S, Jebus. Now, the problem is that when you read about the inhabitants of that city in the King James Version, it calls them Jebusites. So when you read Jebusites, it confuses you. There is actually nothing like Jebusites in the original scripture. But, you know, when you were translating the Bible, they just added it, it as a generic term. So if you were from Edom, they would call you in the King James Version an Edomite. If you were from Reuben, they would call you a Reubenite. So when you say that word, just remove that word. It's going to confuse, confuse you. You see... The actual word there is Jebu, Jebu. The modern day Jebu people in Nigeria are actually the same people that were living in that Jebu that, that you read in Judges 19.11. It's actually that, because you, you are, you are not Ijebu. So if you're not Ijebu, you will call them Ijebu. The Ijebu people don't call themselves Ijebu. They call themselves Jebu. The I is silent. It is that J-E-B-U-S, Jebu. Now, one thing you know about the, 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 the Jebu people is that the Jebu people, they name their towns after topography. So, for instance, you have Jebu Ode, which is um, Jebu in the outer areas. Then you have Jebu yeah. Ibo, Jebu Ibo, which is the Jebu forest. in the forest. You see? You, then you also have, uh, they, they give themselves a different kind of Jebu. They name themselves after their topography. Now, I went to Jerusalem. I went to Jerusalem. I went to old Jerusalem. And then, you know, I was, I was taken about by rabbis. And then you probably saw my pictures because you commented on them. Now, you see, yeah. um, uh, old Jerusalem and new Jerusalem are in a valley and they're surrounded by hills. And then they will tell you that you, the people, the original inhabitants of, of Jerusalem were actually the Jebu. Now, they, 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 had, they had about three distinct types of Jebu. They had Jebu in the mountains, on top of the mountains. And then you had Jebu in the valley. Now, the Jebu in the valley were actually, the, the ones on the mountain, they call them Jebu Oke. Jebu Oke. The ones in the valley, they call them Jebu Saleh. Jebu Saleh. That, that, the word Jerusalem is a bastardization of Jebu Saleh. That is Jebu Isale. Jebu Isale is just like valley down in, 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 in um, ancient Edekiri, which is the actual name of the Yorubas. Because Yoruba is a new word. It's a word that came about in 1874. It's not the real name of the tribe called Yoruba. It's actually Edekiri. So in ancient Edekiri, Isale is like, you know, down, valley. It so is. it was, yeah. So it's, so it's Jebu Sale, Jebu Sale. And it's, so when um, King David finally conquered them, and then the Jews now took over, that word now bastardized and became from Jebu Sale, became Jerusalem. Now, you will never, ever get this if you're reading the King James Version. When I read the original scriptures, it was like scales fell out of my eyes. I'll tell you something. I read Genesis 10, 18. So Genesis 10, 8 in, in Hebrew. When I read it, I saw a word um, and then kush, kush. And then um, uh, uh, they, they said uh, namurud, namurud being kush. Now, um, uh, ben in Hebrew is son. 
So what they're saying is that uh, Namurud, son of Kosh. But, so I now asked the rabbi who was teaching me, I said, who is Namurud? I said, Namurud, that is Namurud. So when he saw how frustrated I was, then he went and he put Namurud in um, an English dictionary and said, oh, Nimrod. So I said, what do you mean, Nimrod? I said, then, then why is it Nimrod in the King James Version and other English translations? He said, ask me, I don't know. In, ori in, 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 in original Hebrew, the name of Nimrod is actually Namrud, and it's the same name in Arabic. Now, who is the father of the Yoruba race in ancient uh, folklore? Lamurudu. Lamurudu <laughs> is the father of Oduduwa. Lamurudu. Now, the issue of this now, you will say, okay, um, well, in, 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 the age, in the original Hebrew, it is Namrud. So in Lamurudu cannot be the same person as Namrud. No. In, your, in ancient Adekiri language, there is... A, um, they interchange L and N. So, for instance, in, 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 in among the Edekiris, who, 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 the real name of the Yoruba, if your name is Limota, sometimes they can call you. If you are in, if you are in um, Oyo, they will say Limota. If you are in Oshu, they will say Nimota. My so mother, mother, that was my grandmother's name. So she oh, was see? and Limota. And I used to wonder, oh, come, how can you? <laughs> no, um, no, it's not. That, that, that's, that, that's ancient Yoruba, or rather ancient Edekiri language. For instance, now, in ancient Edekiri language, or to use the word Yoruba, if I want to say, I can say, Kini Owi, or Kilowi. Yes. So, you see, N and L. So that La Murudu, who, is, who, who, who they say is the father of Odudua, is actually the same Na Murudu. In uh, who, who uh, that is that is called Nimrod in the English um, in the English um, um, uh, King James version. Now, how do we know that that is true? If you look at it, um, it says in um, in Genesis chapter ten verse eight that that Namrud is the son of Cush. And do you know the meaning of the word Cush? Ethiopia. No, no, no. Cush means black. Black. Yes. Yeah, sorry. 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 Cush. Cush. I, Cush. Yeah, Kush means that. Now, see, you also, you also, if I you, are getting, you are allowing the King James Version to confuse you. Now, when you see the word Ethiopia, uh, when, when, when you see the word Ethiopia in the, uh, in the King James Version, uh, in the Old Testament, it's not referring to the, to the nation known as Ethiopia. It's the nation known as Ethiopia is, is referred to in the King James Version as Sheba. Sheba. Yeah. Now, when you see the word Ethiopia, it's actually referring to sub-Saharan Africa, Black Africa. Or greater so, part of Africa. Exactly. So when you see Genesis chapter 2, verse 13, when it uses the word uh, Kush, and then Ethiopia, yeah, the, the King James Version uses the word um, um, uh, Ethiopia. The New International Version uses the word Kush. It's actually referring to Black Africa. So one of the things you need to understand is this. Look at, a lot of people say that, okay, they, they reject Christianity because Christianity is um, a white man's religion. It's a basic form of, it, it's, it's highly ignorant. Because if you look, who wrote, who wrote the book of Genesis and the first five books of, Moses, of, of the Bible? Who? You tell me. Moses, right? Moses, Moses yeah. authored it. Okay, and now, the, it's like the, the Pentateuch. Now, how, how did Moses get that knowledge? A lot of people don't realize that. Moses was married to a black woman. Yes, he was. He wasn't married to an. He wasn't married to an Ethiopian because if he was married to an Ethiopian, they would have said he was married to a Sheba, a Sheban, a Sheban. No, he said he was married to Numbers chapter twelve, verse one. Yeah, and he says that Miriam and, uh, and uh, Aaron were upset with Moses because he had married a Kushite woman, meaning black. Yes, right. Now here's the thing. What does it say? How, uh, what does it say before Moses had his encounter with God in the body bush? Who was his teacher? Go and read Exodus 18 24. It was her father who was his teacher. He said that, that Moses did everything her father told him to do. Her father was Moses' teacher. In fact, her father was Moses' mentor. So that is why when you read the, the Levitical laws, when you read them, it sounds like the laws of an African village. So, for instance, when they tell you that if you die, and you don't have a, ch a child, then your younger brother will inherit your, your wife. That's Yoruba culture, or, or rather, a Dekiri culture. Because you have to understand Even that... It's a test in, in the book of Deuteronomy, um, where if, uh, how do they prove that a virgin, a woman married as a virgin, is the, the blood stains on the white sheet is a Yoruba tradition. 
it's exactly it's an educator it's, it's an educator culture for instance now when you talk about when if, when you see in um in the writings of moses how did they consult god now if you read the king james version they will tell you that they cast lots they cast lots now you see when you read all those things and when you see these things they've been anglicized do you know what lots are lots is just divination divination, divination. Now, if I, div, divination, divination, the origin of divination is Ifa, Ifa, which is an Edekiri. Now, I'm not saying go out and do Ifa. Ifa is demonic. You see, so, if, 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 so, but the practice of it is that, is that divination. So, you see, a lot of all, the, a, a lot of the, of the cultures that you see. Joseph have cast lots. Sorry? Joseph cast lots. Not Joseph. just Joseph. Just even, even in the New Testament, even in the New Testament, when uh, after, um, after uh, Judas um, killed himself, the 11 other disciples, they cast lots to choose oh, who to was going to re replace him. They actually cast lots. To pick uh, the Roman soldiers. Matthias. Matthias. Yes, Matthias. And the Roman soldiers also cast lots to divide Christ's clothes. You see, the thing that uh, I, I really get upset with uh, modern day um, Africans because in their rush to, um, to abandon everything about their culture, I mean, look at me. I've been in the States since I was nine years old. But yet, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I speak my language. I speak Ishekiri. I speak Yoruba. Now I'm learning Ijebu. I taught myself Hebrew and Greek. Because I want to know about our culture. You see, Africans, Africans will say, okay, well, mm, they're not going to have anything to do with a masquerade. You know, a masquerade is fetish. A masquerade. African masquerades, they, say they are not going to happen. But these are the same people who will uh, grad, grad the, I mean, take on Santa Claus and then take their kids to go right. see Santa Claus. Where do you see, where do you see for the Christmas of Santa Claus in the Bible? No way. What do you see? I mean, Nigerians and Africans, you know, like they look down on traditional African marriages. Do you know that traditional African marriages is actually in the Bible? Are you aware of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, this white wedding, it is the one that is not in scripture. There is no white yeah. wedding in scripture. But that is the one that we respect. That's, that is the one that's... In traditional African weddings, they carry wine. Exactly. There are two Remember things that we do. There are two things that you do in traditional African marriage, which is also in scripture. You exchange gifts and you exchange wine. You exchange hot, uh, hot drink. That's the traditional marriage. That, that's what it is. So we as Africans, we need to, it's just, for example, you know, like um, um, uh, I, I, I was doing something somewhere and then somebody just told me, no, don't have anything to do with that guy. He's a babalao. I said, and what is bad with babalao? Do you know what a babalao is? A babalao is a herbalist. He said, yes, herbalist about I said, well, what do you mean herbalist about? Go and read it there. In the book of Revelations, even in heaven, they use herbs to treat. In heaven, it's there. In the, in the book of Revelations, when we die and we go to heaven, the Bible says that we are going to be using herbs, leaves, for the healing of the nations. So a lot of us, we don't understand our culture. We look down on our culture, and then we, we, we so, um, we so uh, um, uh, promote Western culture. And they think that, that was that, that's one of the issues. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we're, we're running out of time, so um, a lot of people are pushing for, for me to ask you this particular question. Uh, and it has to do with creation. Um, we've gone back and forth. Um, I don't know, Ada, were you there that day when we talked about creation? Um, what about creation? Um, who did Cain get married to? Oh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. So um, a lot of people have been asking that question. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity for you to uh, throw some light on it. Because I'm of the opinion that uh, a lot of people suggest that Cain married his sister. But I'm of the opinion that that would have been scripturally impossible. So what is your take? Well, here's the thing, you know, I believe that scripture is the word of God, completely and totally the word of God. So I, I don't like to go out of scripture. You know, um, can you still hear me? I can hear you clearly. Okay, yeah. So I don't want to go out of scripture. And so if you, read, if you look at scripture, in scripture, when they're doing the genealogy in, in scripture, completely in all the 66 books of, uh, of, uh, of uh, scripture, women are silent. You know, because um, uh, in Hebrew tradition, they don't, uh, they don't um, number women. So, for instance, if you read um, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 11, after Jesus, uh, after, after Yeshua, rather, Christ had fed the 5,000, it said, it, it said that, and there were 5,000 men there, not counting women. 
So they don't count women in um, Hebrew um, 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 uh, scripture. And, you know, even if you read in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 all the way to 14, when they were talking about Christ's genealogy, no woman was mentioned. The only time a woman was mentioned is in, I think it was in verse 18, when they talk about Mary, and they only mentioned her as the wife of Joseph. So women are not reckoned with in, uh, in scripture in terms of genealogy. So when you read in scripture, for instance, and you're reading that... Um, up to, because I, I, I beg to differ. Um, in Genesis chapter 4, the genealogy of Cain was mentioned. And... Um, if you study the genealogy of Cain, uh, maybe I should actually go there right now with a scripture. Just um, one second. Uh, Genesis chapter four. If you if you can go there with me, uh, guys. You, you want me let, to go there? Oh, okay. Um, I think I okay. to He wants me to go on scripture. Thank you. Susan. Plan. So so let's look at this. The descendants of Cain. Now, Cain had sexual relations with his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain founded a city which he named Enoch after his son. Enoch had a son named Erad and Erad became the father of Mehujadel and Mehujadel became the father of Methusael and Methusael became the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women. So they're mentioning the women. The first was Ada and the second was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal who was the first of those who raised livestock and live in tents. His brother's name was Jubal, the first who played the harp and the flute. Lamech's other wife, Zillah, gave birth to a son named Tubal Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain had a sister named Nama. Uh, one day, Lamech said, uh, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Listen to me, you wives of Lamech. I killed a man who attacked me. A young man who wounded me. Who's this young man? He killed someone. None of uh, Adam's descendants were killed. There's no record of any of Adam's descendants being killed. And no record of Cain's descendants being killed. So who is this man that was killed? I still continue. If someone who kills Cain is punished seven times, the one who kills me will be punished 77 times. Then... Adam had sexual relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to another son named Seth. For she said, God has granted me another son in place of Abel, whom Cain killed. So there was no other child until Seth. Then Seth grew up, and he had a son named Seth. Uh, and if you uh, this is what ends up in his stem. When Adam was a hundred and he became the father of the son who was just a king. Very image Seth. After the birth of Seth, Adam lived another eight hundred had son and daughter. So there is no record. Um, before the birth of of any other women in these scriptures, there's the book of heard of that book. Yeah, sorry, the book of what? My, my, um, the book of what? Jubilee. Is that in the scripture? It's not in the scriptures. It's okay, okay. No, no, no. I, I don't read books that are out of scripture because like... Uh, no, no, hold on, hold on. I, 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 don't, I don't read books that are, that are um, not scriptural because sometimes you open up yourself to seductive demonic spirits when you read those kind of books. So, I mean, if you talk about those kind of books, I'm not going to know what you're talking about. So go ahead. He has the only case, case for Adam, for instance. Okay, but uh, uh, if I die, can you hear me clearly? Because my, I yes. think my airports died. Can you hear me? Very clearly. Okay, so, so here's the thing. Now, we, we, if, if we're going to use uh, scripture just as our guide, because Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the hidden things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that have been revealed belong to us and our children so that we can do all the things written in this law. So I can, I'm only going to go what has been, on what has been revealed by God through scripture. So one thing we know is that um, in genealogy, women are not mentioned. Now, if, 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 when you're talking about the scripture that you just read, now we see scriptures like that, whereby when people marry, they talk about their wives. That's not genealogy. I'm talking about like genealogy, for instance, because you, you're going to read... If, if, if you read the, uh, the genealogy of Adam, 
which I, I believe is in um, uh, Genesis um, 10. Yeah, if, 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 so if you read that, so if you read that, you will see um, um, all the way to Noah, and then all the way from Noah, Noah had Shem, Japheth, and Ham, Ham had Cush. The women are not mentioned. So here's what, here's what I, know, uh, I know about scripture. Um, before Moses brought the Levitical law, um, uh, people could marry their sisters. So for instance, now you see that Abraham married Sarah, and Sarah was his sister. I'm sure you know that. And it's not just that, you know, like um, 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 uh, Rebecca was the first cousin of her husband, Isaac. So I believe that Cain married his sister because we know that that was, that, that was allowed in scripture. But when you begin to bring in like um, extra scriptural things like, like that lady that you mentioned, I don't want to mention it. I think really we've got to be careful oh. doing that. Lily. Well, I mean, I don't want to start calling the name. It's not in scripture. You you know? by... Sorry? I think people are having Yeah, I'm also having issues with your sound. I, I, it, it's breaking up a bit, but um, I, I, can, I can pick you uh, in bits and pieces. But can you hear me clearly? Um, I can you clearly. So maybe I should just question that... Um, people are asking on uh, uh, and that has some fast run out of it. We might need to that really soon. Okay, so go, go ahead with the question. What's the question? Okay, so Adal, um, if I call the air here and then he wants to know uh, take on yeah. but, I, I, I can't hear her. I, I can't hear her. It's okay, not legible. Out, out, out. Okay, okay. Okay. He wants to know about people protesting in Nigeria with some of the protests dealt with that. Uh, can, can you say it one more time? You broke up. So sorry. So sorry. Um, the Black Lives Matter protest here, while we're not there protesting, why are they Right. Oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you, but I think you're asking about a, a Black Lives Matter protest in Nigeria. Well, I mean, the, with the issue with the Black Lives um, uh, Matter protest in Nigeria, you know, like, uh, I don't know if people are really going to take us seriously, because I'll give you an example, you know, uh, what they're doing right now with Black Lives Matter, the protest, they've moved beyond the stage whereby uh, they're just protesting. Now, it, uh, they're protesting even, um, even historical uh, wrongs like slavery. So in America and in the United Kingdom and in Europe, they are taking the statues of, um, of uh, slave traders and people who supported slavery, and then they are destroying them, beheading them, throwing them into the sea. But here's the funny thing now. In Nigeria, we had a town in Nigeria called Escravos in Delta State. Now, do you know what Escravos means? Escravos means slave. And yet, we have a town in Nigeria called Escravos. Escravos means slave. We have another town in Nigeria called Forcados. Forcados means first laborer, which is another, like a more polite term for slave. And then we, we have, can you imagine, we have a town in Nigeria called slave in Portuguese, Escravos. We also have another town called Forcados. Right there in the heart of Lagos, where they were doing this um, a Black Lives Matter protest, there is a statue of a lady, Madame Tinubu, who was a notorious slave trader. So you can see that we, we have our own challenges in Nigeria. We are so very, it's very easy for, for the media to control us and then we now become outraged and then we now um, uh, get into a frenzy. We have deep issues within, well, we have deep, deep, deeper issues in our country. So I, I told you the cases of the, um, of the police brutality, the police killings that we've had, you know, and how we've not, we've not addressed that. And so what we are, it's like, it's just like you have a cancer right now. And then instead of treating your cancer, 
you want to devote your energy to treat somebody, your neighbor who has a headache. Mm. Absolutely. Um, check your WhatsApp. I know I sent a question. I sent something to you. Just hear me. Okay, okay, hang on. Um, give me a second. Let me go on WhatsApp. Okay, please. So, Ada, um, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I saw the question, but I don't know if we have enough time. I'm sure everyone enjoyed this. I had a crowd this loud in a long time. So much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, I think I had some audio uh, issues. But we're going to do this again. Okay. I'm game. I'm game. I'm game. <laughs> I'm game. This again. Thank you so much for coming. We've got thank you for right. having me, and then thank you to all your listeners. You know, um, I thank you for the listeners of Nigerian Info and uh, those who listen on Instagram. Thank you very much. And you uh, posted live on Instagram. Thank you. All right, um, Ada, let's take quick phone calls, if we can take a few. Um, I'm sure with the level of information that was being given out, nobody wanted to tune off. At a point, we had about 800 people watching only on Instagram and uh, yeah. about 100 and something people on uh, YouTube and also Facebook. Uh, and of course, the live radio audience. So please, let's take three phone calls in quick succession so that people too can be part of it. Absolutely. Hello? Oh, I'd call back if that was you. Hello, good evening. Yeah, good evening. How are you? Hi. Yeah, I'm very fine. How are you? Fine, thank you. What's your name? So, Ola, what do you think about the interview? Uh, good evening, good evening, Daddy, please. Good evening, Ola, real quick. We don't have much time. What did you What do you think about the interview? What was your take? Yes. Can we squeeze in one more call? And um... okay, hello, Hello. Yeah, good evening. How are you? Ah, we can't hear that call. We need a good call. Hello, can you speak up? Thank you. 
Messages on WhatsApp. Uh, we have uh, a couple of them. We are out of time. Absolutely, Ada. I was just hoping we could sneak some in because uh, everywhere is a bit heated up and, I, I, and I'm sure people want to, uh, as much as possible, hear more or be able to drop in their comments. Tomorrow we will... Okay. Tomorrow we'll be talking about the OSU caste system again uh, and local... Uh, forms of discrimination that we believe are on par with racism globally. Uh, and, and we'd love it if you are a part of this show online and offline. The radio station is called 99.3 Nigeria Info, and it is absolutely wonderful. You guys should join us um, tomorrow and I, I promise you, you will not regret it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Extra thanks to Ada, who I know is a bit under the weather, but still had to come because nobody can moderate like Ada does. Mm. Our, radio, our radio concubines can never be like our radio wives. <laughs> our radio side chicks can never be... <laughs> Thank you so much, Daddy Free. Thank you, thank you. I was almost heartbroken when I when I realized that you might not come. That's why I sent you that WhatsApp message. Ada, are you coming? <laughs> and Ada said, yes. I said, just come, drag yourself, crawl, but just be there. <laughs> because life and dangerous without Ada in such a dire interview would would not um would not suffice thank you so much ada and please be around tomorrow so we can discuss um the osuka system and other forms of local uh discrimination thank you so much guys and god bless you all right thank you so much Daddy. please do have a great night Whew. It is 99.3 nigeria and there was life and dangerous with that phrase you know it's always a uh, uh, a great show with him and everybody please stop staring at me go away <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been absolutely wonderful. Big shout out to um, Reno Omokri, who um, came. I, I tried to let him talk, even where we disagreed. I tried to I allow him to talk because he's my guest. But there's next time there are things that I will not agree with him. Who, Especially with that, um, I, I don't think Reno and I disagree on much except the creation story. But we're going to have this some other day, very soon. And it, it, trust me, it's going to get heated. Uh, make sure you listen to 99.3 Nigeria Info. It is where everything is happening now. You want to hear the news, just stay glued to 99.3 um, Nigeria Info. Now, guys, don't forget, I need to tell you about this amazing book. It is called The Greatest Reality Show. Okay? And um, I want us to talk about this, and um, I appeal to you guys to get it because he's a wonderful gentleman who has supported us, Melvin Ejogu. Melvin, are you around? It's not the kind of interview you miss, Melvin. Has anybody seen Melvin? Real quick, as I officially sound, sign off. Melvin, 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 where are you? Melvin. Okay. Um, by the way, just in case you're not here, please um, do get that book. It's very important. The Greatest Reality Show. This is what it looks like. This is what the cover of the book looks like. I hope I can expand this with my fingers enough for you guys to see it. Uh, just cut my face out of it. This is what it looks like on Amazon. Please make sure 
you you get the book the greatest reality show and they're giving and um they're also giving out stuff so do check it out www dot the greatest reality show um the greatest reality show i think that is it yes the greatest reality show dot com dot ng the book is 1400 naira only if you order online and it is called the greatest reality show by melvin Ejogu. This, this is what it looks like. Guys, make sure you get it. It's available on Amazon. Okay? Okay? So please make sure you get that. Uh, the Greatest Reality Show by Melvin Ejogu. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Do take care of yourselves, and God bless you. I appreciate you all for, for joining us. And remember, we're going to be keeping it live like this on 99.3 Nigeria Info. The station is 99.3 Nigeria Info. God bless you. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Daddy Freeze Teaches. YouTube.com forward slash Daddy Freeze Teaches. The show is from 10 to midnight every single day 10 o'clock to midnight please make sure you join us it's an absolutely wonderful show support us support me thank you very much once again thank you very much to reno amokri for um the amazing interview we really touched a lot of places and it will be available on um, youtube.com forward slash daddy freeze teaches and also would be available uh on instagram so it would be saved up for you on instagram so please do check that out god bless you guys take care of yourselves and hopefully see you tomorrow remember to get yourself a copy of the greatest reality show by melvin ajogu www.thegreatestrealityshow.com.ng get yours now